Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Carolyn Wolf Stewart. Good morning, everyone. Could I please ask you to take your seats? I'm Caroline Wolf Stewart, Senior Director, Strategy and Operations at the Nova Scotia College of Nursing and a Halifax Chamber board member. And I'm pleased to host for the annual state of the Premier with Premier McNeil. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsor, National Public Relations. National has supported this event for many years and we truly appreciate their commitment. We look forward to hearing from the Premier on important issues facing our members today. Given if it's February, I'd like to shout out African Heritage Month. There have already been some very exciting events that have taken place and some announcements to note, one in particular, the Canada Post Stamp commemorating the Coloured Hockey Championship of the early 20th century. And there are also many, many other events happening all around the city. I would encourage you to get a full list at ansa.novascotia.ca or Google African Heritage Month Nova Scotia. I'd like to take this time to introduce our head table. Please stand as I say your name and would ask the audience to please hold any applause until the end. Our speaker today, the Honorable Stephen McNeil, Premier of Nova Scotia. He deserves some applause. <laughs> Patrick Sullivan, President and CEO, Halifax Chamber of Commerce. Paul Bent, retired consultant and chair of the Halifax Chamber's Fostering Private Sector Growth Task Force. Cynthia Dorrington, President, Vale & Associates Human Resource Management and Consulting, Inc., and past chair of the board, Halifax Chamber of Commerce. Don Bureau, President, Nova Scotia Community College, and chair of the Halifax Chamber's Accessing a Skilled Workforce Task Force. Cameron Turnbull, General Manager, CanCham PRD. Nick Jennery, Executive Director, Feed Nova Scotia. Gavin McDonald, partner Cox and Palmer and Vice Chair of the Board, Halifax Chamber of Commerce. Peter McIntosh, Chief Research Officer and partner with Narrative Research. And Sarah Young, Managing Partner, National Public Relations. Thank you all for joining us. Please take your seats. I would also like to take a moment to thank our Chamber Ambassadors for joining us and helping us out today. James Cavan, MBS Radio Halifax, Judith Kays, MS Society of Canada, Atlantic Division, and Mitch Donnelly, Discover Halifax. Also, I would ask you to be part of the conversation today and tweet along with us using hashtag HCC Premier. That's HCC Premier. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll be back in approximately 40 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Patrick Sullivan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to thank my table for the applause. <laughs> welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, the Canard Centre team has done a wonderful job preparing the meal. And thank you once again to our sponsor, National Public, Public Relations, for enabling us to host this event today. I'm delighted to welcome you to our annual State of the Province, where today we'll be able to, you'll be able to, ask the Premier about Nova Scotia's current state and, of course, our opportunities for the future. If you have a question for the Premier, please write it down on the question cards at your table and raise your hand and staff will be around to collect them once the Premier takes the stage. 
At the chamber, we could probably talk about provincial policy and budgets forever, but for the sake of time, I would like to present a very few uh, of our key areas of focus for 2021 and our pre-budget submission. 2020 welcomes a new decade. We're one year into our 2019 to 2023 strategic plan and our board of directors and task forces are focused on achieving our plans, goals, and we've talked to key stakeholders in our community. In addition, our members have met one-on-one -on -one with municipal and provincial staff to, to uh, discuss challenges and roadblocks to the future. You will have seen our goals flipping through the, uh, the screen during lunch, so I won't take the time to go through those again, but you can certainly find them on our website at halifaxchamber.com. Our list of goals may seem extensive, but we believe that working with stakeholders and partners, members can use their voice for the betterment of the business community and of course, the province. In our current pre-budget, uh, provincial pre-budget submission, we suggested to the government that we know budgets are tough to, uh, to develop, uh, but we think it's important uh, that budgets be zero-based budgets to start. Let's not start with where we ended last year. We recommended that if departmental expenses are rising above inflation, that increases, those increases in funding should be used to cover debt repayment, keeping in mind the annual uh, interest costs are almost 10% of the provincial budget or slightly over $800 million. We've also asked the government to remove the capped assessment program and an all party committee has been looking at this now and we presented just last week. We are pleased to hear that the province continues to make trade and export a priority for Nova Scotia. We agree that eliminating trade barriers by aligning regulatory differences is key to Nova Scotia's growth, both export, internationally, and domestically. A reduction in these barriers will be invaluable for many of our niche industries in Nova Scotia. Our members also often remind us that expanding our areas of trade will not only increase our potential export opportunities, but will also open new immigration markets for our province. The Halifax Chamber is very pleased to work with NSBI on the new National Trade Accelerator Program, or TAP, uh, which will provide our members with high-level training and support to become successful international tra traders and grow both Halifax and Nova Scotia's GDP. And while we support Develop Nova Scotia in their efforts in partnership with the province to bring better wireless and internet services to all of Nova Scotia, as announced last week, we want to ensure that the province's key economic driver, Halifax, does not lag behind. New 5G wireless networks are expected to create more than 250,000 permanent jobs and contribute an estimated $40 billion annually to Canada's economy over the next few years. And we need in Nova Scotia to be part of that growth. Our Accessing a Skilled Workforce Task Force, led by Don Bureau of NSCC, has committed to enhance the awareness of the current and upcoming labor shortage in our province and the benefits of hiring students, recent graduates, and those in the hidden talent market. On a positive note, we would very much like to commend the province in their effort to reduce the regulatory burden for business. The Department of Regulatory Affairs and Service Effectiveness is working towards making a business environment more positive and open for entrepreneurs, employees, and their employers. We hope this work continues as there's still much to do to reduce the roadblocks and red tape our members face daily. We've outlined some of those tough recommendations and points of interest, but I certainly know that Premier McNeil is not afraid of the challenge. After four years of balanced budgets, I also know that many of those challenges have been met. I am looking forward to our discussion today and to hearing what he thinks business can, can and should do to continue leading our province to success. We're very proud of the progress Halifax and Nova Scotia have made in the past number of years because if Halifax succeeds, so does the rest of the province. Our full 2021 provincial pre-budget submission can be found on our website's homepage. I'd now like to introduce the representative from National, who has recently moved back to Halifax after a few years in Calgary and Ottawa. Please join me in welcoming Emma Cochran, consultant, National Public Relations to the stage to say a few words and to introduce the Premier, Emma.
Thank you, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be here today. At National, we talk about moving the horizon. By that, we mean looking at what can be done and then pushing it even further. Ultimately, it's about being bold, ambitious, and exceeding those goals. And not just thinking locally or nationally, but globally. We get to collaborate every day with Nova Scotian companies, universities, organizations, and individuals who share that exact same ambition. They believe in this province. They want to see what is possible, and they know that means looking at things differently. We are seeing unprecedented growth and change. We need to look at the world with fresh eyes. That may mean using new Canadians' fresh perspectives, or harvesting entrepreneurial youth to thrive growth, or challenging the status quo. We need to stop thinking of risk and change as things to overcome. They are the energy that fuels innovation, and they can be harnessed to do just that. On each of your tables, you're going to see a box that looks just like this. These are what we car call the Clarity Card Box. We're thinking of harnessing that 2020 vision as we come into a new decade. It's a simple group exercise for achieving clarity by looking at a challenge from multiple different perspectives. It's ultimately about seeing things clearly, because when you see things clearly, the horizon doesn't seem as far away as you may think. And now, I'm very excited to introduce Premier Stephen McNeil. Premier McNeil is driven by his core values and has a passion for Nova Scotia. After owning and operating a small business in Bridgetown for 18 years, he won the privilege of serving the people of Annapolis in the provincial legislature in 2003. McNeil became leader of the Nova Scotia Liberal Party in 2007 and led his team to a majority election in October 2013 and then again in May 2017. As Premier, he advocates for Nova Scotia, both in Ottawa and on the world stage. His clear vision for inclusive growth for all of Nova Scotia has led to stable financial growth. And this financial growth has en enabled the government to make investments in key priorities Nova Scotians care about, like healthcare, education, immigration, and creating new opportunities for young people. Now, before uh, the Premier joins us on stage, I'm gonna ask everyone to uh, take a turn to the screens behind me for a short video clip. 25 plus one. Reasons why. Nova Scotia was awesome. In 2019. Because. We got serious about the environment. Because we're protecting more coastline. And we protected more biodiversity. And we're banning these. Because. We're thinking about our future and more people will get to have a future. Because there'll be more help for people if they need it. Because knowledge is power. And an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. For body and mind. Because I'm gonna be a doctor. Because being inclusive means taking action. Because we're free to choose, our names belong to us. Because I don't have to say I'm someone I'm not. Because I can be who I am and live here. Because it's easier to stay here. Because it's easier to learn. Because I opened my own business. Because I'm working. And it's easier for me to get back to work. Because, because we gave to Nova, Nova Scotia. Scotia. Because we kicked butt at the Canada Winter Games. Because they like us. They really like us. Especially our spirits. And our seniors. Because Nova Scotians are just plain awesome. Yeah! And now there's more of us than ever before. Looking forward to even more awesome things. 
in 2020. Well, that was a that was a great start. Uh, that uh, probably took a few years to uh, to put together. Actually, I suppose when you think about the content. No. No. Okay. <laughs> before before you start, Patrick, I, I just wanted to acknowledge Emma, who was here. Uh, first of all, welcome home. Uh, you were so impressive, quite frankly. I'm, that's why this room should be so optimistic about our future. Uh, the only thing that would have made it better if it had said Bridgetown, not Bridgewater. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome, Premier. Um, I guess you had no problem finding your way down here today. Um, I've heard talk lately that some people think there aren't enough parking lots in Peninsula Halifax, <laughs> but it's it's good that you were able to find a spot. Well, I do a lot of walking, so do it's you? okay. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, please uh, write down your questions, hold up your hand. Uh, I do have some questions to start. That may come as a surprise. Uh, roughly nine pages of questions. I don't think we'll get through them all. Um, so here's the first question. As you look to the future, do you see post the, the post-secondary sector, and I notice a number of uh, universities in the room, and of course NSCC, do you see the post-secondary sector, universities NS, and NSCC, as key economic drivers and key immigration strategists that support provincial initiatives? Well, first of all, let me welcome Dr. Deep Sani, who's here, I think, uh, with Dalhousie. Welcome uh, to Nova Scotia. You are joining uh, a great fraternity of university presidents and universities in our province. Uh, we are grateful, quite frankly, for all 10 of you. Uh, I, for one, believe they are an asset to our province, not a liability on, on the line item. And the growth that we have seen uh, in Nova Scotia over the last five or six years is because of the partnerships that we've been able to develop with the universities around ensuring that we drive innovation. If you look at the issues, that, whether it's at Cove, uh, whether it is here at Volta, whether it's the Ideas Hub, or quite frankly, the work that's happening in some of our rural campuses, whether it's the wine industry in Acadia or what's going on at, at, in Truro at the Agricultural College. It's been a true collaboration and a recognition by the universities that not only are they great educational institutions, but they have to play a role of driving the economy of our province. And through them, they're welcoming 20,000 young people, some from international communities and some from across Canada to come to Nova Scotia and join us. Uh, and we've been working hard with them to ensure that we attach those people to the workforce. And it can only happen when you as the business community step up and say, you know what, we're gonna take a chance on a new hire. That's why the graduate to opportunities where we partner with the business community to keep these young people here. Last year was the first time in my lifetime, and I turned 55 in November, that we got younger. More young people have stayed in Nova Scotia the last three years and left. And that's been because of the level of collaboration that has taken place between all of our public institutions and the private sector. It will require all of us to continue on the path we've been on, which is one of recognizing we're in this together. Government doesn't have all the answers, nor is it the cause of all of our problems. <laughs> I do take responsibility for some of them. <laughs> but together, and recognizing that each of us have a role to play and what that role is, we can continue to grow this province economically and grow the fabric of our province to be the diverse community that it should be. That's great. On, on diversity, um, many of the Ivany goals are being met, so great to see. Uh, that they are. Uh, the Chamber is actually part of the collective, which reviews and evaluates those goals on an annual basis. But there are a few goals that aren't yet being met, uh, and uh, I'm just wondering how you think some of those goals may be met in the, uh, in the future. See, I always look at the glass as half full. I'm really grateful for the work that we've been able to do together. I want you to think for a minute, take a pause, which is really hard sometimes. We were half a billion dollars in debt, Oat migration, our sons and daughters thought their future was elsewhere. Exports were stagnant. People were looking out beyond our province to make investments. Now fast forward for six years. More young people, exports at record high, immigration at all time high. People choosing to live here. Our, our sons and daughters are seeing a future for themselves in our province. And that's been because of the collaboration that has happened and the work that we've been able to do together. And now we know there's some more work to do. Not everyone is experiencing that success. 
African Nova Scotians and, and Mi'kmaq students are not being attached to the workforce at the rate that our sons and daughters are. We need to continue to work and strive. That's why the Graduate Opportunities has a greater incentive to attach African Nova Scotians or Mi'kmaq students to the workforce. Uh, we need to continue to make sure We need to continue to make sure that this growth is being experienced by everyone and that everyone understands the role in it and everyone should clap themselves on the back for that growth. We've come a long way in six years. And that's not just because you were smart enough to elect a good government. <laughs> it's because we recognize through the Ivany goals that we could do better. That together, we could achieve what we're achieving today and recognize that this is just the beginning. We need to continue to welcome more young people to Nova Scotia. We need to continue to have a diverse population. We need to continue for the business community globally to understand that Halifax, the east coast of Canada, is an important place when you're looking at Canada to make those investments. You can have a global office from in Nova Scotia, not only to deal with your Canadian customers, but your global customers, and we can continue to build on that. Uh, I did allude to the parking garage. Uh, I don't want to talk about the parking garage, but I want to talk about the idea of uh, creative thinking, um, a generational spend that will be the QE uh, redevelopment. Um, it's going to be billions of dollars, and also the, uh, the spend in, uh, in CBRM as well, uh, the other hospital, I guess, the significant hospital. But I, I want to make, I'm sure the people in the audience want to make sure that all the creativity uh, that can be brought to bear for 20, 30, 40, 50 is being brought to bear on these projects to make sure we have something that's going to be viable and useful and transformative for the next 30, 40 years. I, I feel very fortunate uh, and lucky uh, that uh, we came to government at the time uh, that all of the challenges showed up at the QE2. And I mean that. Uh, we are given an opportunity, when I say we, not just us as government, but quite frankly us as a community, to help reshape the delivery model of healthcare for the next 50 and 60 years. Not many generations get that privilege. Uh, working with our healthcare providers as we've been looking at how do we expand cancer care, not only here but on Cape Breton Island, how do we ensure that we have the modern technologies the, uh, and equipment, has been a wonderful experience uh, for us to ensure uh, that uh, not only is our government not looking at the next five years, uh, but the, the health community has been looking at the next 40 and 50 years as we design and build uh, this new facility. I know the mayor is here, uh, somewhere here, your worship. Uh, I do appreciate our partnership and relationship uh, uh, and contrary to what uh, may be reported and read about in the news uh, uh, around parking, uh, we have had a great partnership with the city. Uh, we will continue to have a great partnership with the city. Uh, and the mayor and I had breakfast on uh, Monday and I think we both have come to the realization uh, that cooler heads and calmer minds always find a compromise. Uh, and I appreciate the option that the city has provided us as a government when it comes to uh, ensuring that the sickest among us who are coming downtown for health care uh, have a place to ensure that they have parking and not a way to add to their anxiety by looking for a parking spot. That's great. What, and now we're getting to the audience questions. What concrete actions will the government take to drive Nova Scotia to carbon neutrality by 2050? Uh, listen, we just introduced a piece of legislation in the last sitting of the legislature. We're very proud of the work that we as a province have been doing uh, to ensure that uh, we continue to reduce our greenhouse gas, greening up our energy grid. Uh, very uh, grateful of the work Efficiency Nova Scotia is doing to help all of us reduce our own carbon footprints. Uh, we are on track uh, to be 50 percent below 2005 levels, 2006 levels by 2030. We believe we'd be at, uh, we can uh, reach that target of being neutral in 2050, that's our goal. Uh, but it'll be a partnership not only with government, but it'll be a partnership with private industry uh, and quite frankly individuals who want to play an important role and we can help them uh, through some of the uh, programs that we've already introduced around the energy efficiency program. That's great. Uh, housing supply. So when people move to Nova Scotia, they often think that housing is cheap 
compared to the rest of the world. But the reality is that housing supply is at a 15-year low in Nova Scotia. What can your government do to increase affordable housing supply in the province to make it easier for Nova Scotians to achieve their dreams of home ownership? Well, uh, this would be a combination with us and the municipalities. Uh, the mayor and I actually spoke about this uh, again on, on Monday. We got to cover a lot, Your Worship. Uh, but I, I want to tell you, this is one of the ones that uh, uh, keeps me awake, to be honest with you. Uh, homelessness, affordability. Uh, we have, as a government, uh, brought in a new home ownership program, uh, working to, with young people to buy their first house. Uh, but housing takes on so many forms uh, that it, is, uh, it will take a really diverse solutions to it. This coming budget will be focused uh, on uh, the very issue that you're referring to, some of the investments that we will make. Uh, and my worry is at the national level, uh, especially the stress test that is being put on mortgages at the national level to, work, to deal with the issue of home ownership in Toronto and Vancouver, is having a huge impact, and particularly in the young people in this room and young people across our province, to enter into the housing market for the first time. Uh, we need, and we as a government, are focused on how do can we support them uh, with the down payment. It's not usually the issue of being able to maintain the property when they buy it. Uh, it is the issue of how do I get my down payment. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that the national government will recognize that one size doesn't fit all in Canada. Uh, and we're hoping that this community, uh, the business community, as well as the banking community, can continue to send that message to the national government. Uh, that Nova Scotia is vibrant, it's moving. Uh, the stress test that's being provided for those in Toronto and Vancouver isn't required in this economy or this environment. Uh, and it would go a long way to help uh, kickstart uh, new housing development and new home ownership. Yeah, I agree. Will your government consider applying the hotel levy room tax across the province? Our government will provide an option for those who want to do it. That was quickly to give that was, that was quick. We're short <laughs> Short snappers. This is great. Uh, with the increase in immigration helping to feed the labor shortage, or, or at least solve the labor shortage, what initiatives is the government uh, undertaking to encourage Nova Scotians to relocate back to their home? Oh, that's one of the things we're seeing now. Uh, the repatriation of young people are Nova Scotians coming home. Uh, and we're seeing uh, some uh, people from around the world who are recognizing who are coming here, whether it's for education or seeing an, an economic opportunity coming to stay. Uh, I, you know, I've said this, I think, five years, six years ago uh, around uh, our own children, and my daughter's here somewhere in the crowd, our daughter, I should say, is somewhere here in the crowd. Uh, uh, it's always, I, I, to me, we should all want our children to go out and experience the world. Uh, the only thing is we want to make sure they have a path to come back to. And the vibrancy of the economy will make that happen. Uh, our sons and daughters who are out in the world will want to come home. What they're looking for is to make sure there's a job to come to and a place to raise and grow their families. Uh, and uh, the way to make sure that we continue to provide that option is continue to grow the economy, continue to work with the private sector, continue to provide opportunity. Uh, and we will continue to see the growth of our province as we march towards a million people uh, to be our population. Great. I think there'll be quite a celebration when that happens, the million people. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how does Nova Scotians' relations, how do, how do Nova Scotians' relations with Indigenous people weigh uh, with the Indigenous relations across the country, the current example being the Wet'suwet'en uh, population in, uh, in British Columbia? We're very fortunate uh, here in uh, Nova Scotia. We have one nation, the Mi'kmaq Nation, 13 communities, our, our governments. Uh, and it really goes back uh, to Dr. Savage, who began the relationship, building the relationship with our First Nations community. Uh, they've come together as a community to speak with one voice. Uh, we have tripartite arrangements where we sit down, both the federal government uh, and the province uh, and the Mi'kmaq Nation sit down uh, to collaborate. Uh, and many of our chiefs are pro-development. Uh, many of our chiefs here are looking uh, for growth. They want to provide the same as Quite frankly, the same as I want for the citizens of the province to provide opportunities for all of all of us. They want to ensure that they're providing opportunities for the children and, and people in their communities. Uh, so uh, Nova Scotia, and, and I've said this to the Prime Minister, and I've said it at the table with uh, fellow Premiers, uh, Nova Scotia is an example for the country when it comes to Indigenous relations. Doesn't mean it's always perfect, uh, but it has been a collaborative relationship really 
back uh, really from the mid-1990s, and it's gone through every government of all political stripes in Nova Scotia where we've continued to build on what our predecessors have been doing, uh, and that's why you see the kind of uh, development that is happening in some of our First Nations communities, but also the development that is happening, whether it's an Atlantic Gold project or other projects that will take place in the resource development in our province. Uh, Nova Scotia has some of the highest personal income taxes in Canada. Uh, I'm increasingly hearing uh, that high taxes are now an impediment to recruiting people, the people we need to lead businesses or have specific skills. Will personal income taxes be reduced to attract more people? There's no question it is uh, uh, one of the issues that people look to uh, when looking about coming to Nova Scotia, but there, it is one of many uh, when they look at coming. Uh, the services that they expect our government to provide, uh, quality health care. Uh, I think I've been in the room between the door to here. A couple of people talked to me about not having a doctor. Uh, uh, whether it is that or the investments we're making in pre-primary uh, for young Nova Scotians, government will require uh, uh, money to invest in the services that Nova Scotians have uh, expected uh, to receive and want. Uh, I believe uh, there is a possibility at some point into the future that we need to deal with particularly the upper tax bracket. As you know, the first time that we had any kind of capital as a government, uh, we uh, uh, went after the basic personal exemption where we increased it for low income Nova Scotians. We took 63,000 people off the tax roll. Uh, about 500,000 Nova Scotians received, kept more money in their paychecks. That's turning around in the economy. Uh, and uh, we're seeing the results of that. But in this current budget, we will make some tax changes, but they will not be on the personal income side. Can you provide some more details on the coming budget? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say to all of you uh, how much I appreciate uh, partnering with you. Uh, and I said I started off in 2013. Uh, uh, we had real challenges. Uh, and I had to rely on all of you to grow the economy and provide opportunity as we struggled and made some of the tough decisions that were required to make. Uh, we've cut $34 million of red tape together. Uh, we're committing to cut uh, another 10 million together. Uh, we've continued to welcome more of our sons and daughters home together, and they're coming because you're providing them a job opportunity through the Graduate Opportunity Program, and the Innovate to Rebate, those are important programs where we can collaborate together. Uh, and this budget will be a reflection of that uh, and the commitment that you've made. Uh, we know that our corporate tax is the highest in Canada. We'll be cutting the corporate tax by 2% uh, to take us to 14%. <laughs> and we will also be looking at small business rate, uh, which is a 3%, and we'll drop it to 2.5, which will be uh, lowest in Atlantic Canada. <laughs> that is an investment uh, in you, and quite frankly, it's an investment that I want you to turn around and reinvest in Nova Scotians. Uh, to drive the economy. Uh, together we've done great things, whether it's been with the uh, attaching people to the workforce or the investments that you've made in your company and the innovation tax rebate that we provide it back to 25%. Those are all providing stability, not only in HRM, but across the province. We want to continue on that march. Uh, and uh, this is our partnership to work with you. But I also want to say that that budget, will, our budget coming up, will also reflect uh, a real understanding that there are some people in our province who are not feeling the same growth that we are. Uh, and uh, the budget will be uh, one that ensures uh, that the success that we've enjoyed together, uh, that each Nova Scotian recognizes in our current budget, in our next budget, uh, that we've heard them as well, and that we'll do everything we can, particularly to ensure that, uh, particularly to ensure that our children in this province are not living in poverty. Great. And they tell you I'm not open and transparent. <laughs> I never said that, Premier. Uh, well, you've taken away most of my questions now. Uh, I knew, I knew I'd is, throw you off by answering the question. You did. You answered the question in advance. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know what I'd like to say to that, though? I, I would like to say thank you on behalf of the business community, because I think the business community appreciates that, and you can tell by the applause. But I, but I also can say when I speak to the business community, 
um, I want you to know that they're going to use that money and they're going to invest it in Nova Scotia because that's what they tell me they need to do and want to do to grow both Halifax's economy and the province's economy. So I think that's a good investment on behalf of the province of Nova Scotia. So thank you very much. Um, you've invested a lot of time and, and effort um, and it's paying dividends in China. Uh, we have the coronavirus that's happening in China right now. Do you think that'll have an impact on our trade with China? Uh, and are you concerned? Oh, very concerned. Uh, as much about the people of China, quite frankly. I think, first of all, uh, they've been a great trading partner. But at the heart of all of this, these are people. Uh, and this virus is having a devastating impact on mainland China. Uh, we're seeing it spread beyond. Uh, but first and foremost, my thoughts have been, as I spoke to the ambassador from China to Canada and others, uh, with the, with those citizens who, uh, you know, quite frankly, are struggling uh, with the, with this virus. Uh, we, we'll, you know, we're watching it from an economic point of view for us in trade. We've obviously seen some impact uh, already in terms of the price of our, some of our product. All the more reason why we need to continue to grow our international markets. Uh, you know, when the, the fact. Uh, that we do a now a billion dollars of trade with China uh, is extraordinary considering that in 2013 we were under 200 million. Uh, we, uh, through the work of people in intergovernmental affairs, and uh, continue to work on our uh, European strategy now uh, to open up those uh, markets, not just for seafood but other products. Uh, 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 Minister Colwell has gone to Vietnam and been looking around for other markets as well for the seafood product. But uh, China is an important partner for us. They will be uh, into the future. But of course, we're being very mindful of that, uh, uh, of what's happening there. But first and foremost, for me personally and for our government, is really uh, the impact this is having on the citizens of mainland China. Okay, thank you. Uh, are you willing to look at removing the moratorium on uranium exploration and develop, uh, development to help Nova Scotia with clean energy that is cost effective uh, and employs significant numbers of East Coasters? It has not been something that we have entertained and looked at. Uh, we've been focused on uh, really building an Atlantic Canada transmission system that will allow us to maximize the renewable energies in our region, uh, working with the national government to, to strengthen that tie. Uh, we, believe, uh, uh, we believe we will harness the Bay of Fundy, uh, the opportunities that exist there. Uh, but no, we have not looked at uh, lithium and uranium uh, moratorium. Okay. Uh, the question is, there is immense opportunity for business in Nova Scotia right now. What is your vision for an inclusive and circular economy in Nova Scotia? Well, you're going to have to unpack that question. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a question. I, I, you know, it's, uh, let, Jeez, I'm just a poor kid from Upper Granville, my <laughs> God. Uh, listen, the economic future of our problems will depend that everyone sees themselves in it. Uh, and I, for one, uh, don't believe uh, that uh, we can only look at ourselves to grow this economy. Uh, I'm confident, uh, quite frankly, in the products that we have as a, as a community, uh, whether it's our lobster seafood or whether products that are being made here, I'm confident in the people in this room uh, that when I go into the global community, I'm not looking just to export into New Brunswick or how do we ensure that we can be insular to ourselves. Uh, I'm confident enough uh, that we can compete in the global marketplace. We will do so. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say to you, one of our strengths really has been and has been in the diversity of opportunity, uh, but also the diversity of our province. And we need to embrace that diversity in our workplaces, uh, you know, uh, and um, I just think we need to continue to do what we've been doing uh, and be aggressive about it and be proud about it. Uh, not, be, not be arrogant about it, but be confident about the fact that we can compete globally and we can do it right from here. Um, how can businesses, why don't you give some advice to the businesses in the room? How sure, can the that's what I'm about to do. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Uh, how can businesses support the province in the creation and retention of students, recent grads, and immigrants? What can businesses oh, li do? Listen, you've been doing it. I, I can tell you a welcoming, uh, whether it's university or community college graduate, to the Graduate Opportunities Program. And Don is with us here. Don, thank you for uh, the work that you're doing at the community college and uh, the, the 13 campuses that are in touching almost every part of our province. I and really appreciate uh, the innovation stuff that you're doing uh, there uh, in small towns. Uh, and changing the economy of those small towns by working together. 
But I would say continue to do what you're doing. Continue to hire uh, uh, new immigrants. Welcome our sons and daughters and welcome more Emmets home. Uh, provide them with the opportunity. Uh, and, and I would say continue to look for innovation and development, which you would normally do. Uh, that's what I think has been our greatest success, quite frankly, as a province, is the innovation that's been driven in the private sector. Uh, and the universities have caught on to it. That's why you vote, when you go into Volta, it's alive and well with young people uh, and a few old people. Uh, <laughs> it's why when you go to Cove, you see that. Uh, but that same kind of innovation drive that's happening in those hubs you need to continue to pull that into your workplace, which you've been doing, and it'll go, uh, you'll be on steroids uh, by pulling innovation into your workplace, quite frankly, if you continue to hire the young people that come uh, to Nova Scotia, whether it's to be educated or provide themselves a new future. That's great, thank you. Um, government, what can government do to make access to affordable childcare more available so that more people can take part in the labor market. I mean, we've had a very low unemployment rate, particularly in Halifax, but we've seen a lower unemployment, unemployment rate across Nova Scotia, so. Well, yesterday I was very proud to uh, finalize our commitment on pre-primary, uh, which is one. Which is one of the things that I think uh, will have the greatest impact on our province uh, for decades to come. Every four-year-old, regardless of the socioeconomic circumstances they were born into, will have access to an evidence-based, play-based pre-primary program uh, in our school system. Uh, we believe we've dealt with some of the issues of transportation, uh, that we will see uh, many uh, of our four-year-olds in our province taking advantage of that program, which in turn, quite frankly, allows parents back into the workforce. Uh, we've also invested heavily in childcare sector uh, from uh, investing more to ensure that the pay scale uh, reflects the responsibility that we're asking uh, of early childhood educators when it comes to caring for and looking after our children. Uh, we've invested and worked with the community college to open up more seats. Uh, and by the way, there's a, there's a wait list for the program now because young people see this as a true opportunity to, to raise their families and a way to make it provide an income for their families. Uh, and we will continue uh, to make those investments uh, because it really is about providing choice and options for parents and ensuring that when they decide to go back into the workforce, that they know that the child's in a safe environment, one that is a caring and loving environment, and one that's providing them with an opportunity to play, to learn, to experience uh, what it is, quite frankly, to be in that kind of an environment and build on what they have at home. What is your plan to invest in better health care for Nova Scotians, for example, more doctors, better access to innovative medicines, and partnering with health organizations? Well, first of all, uh, we're spending currently uh, about $2 billion in capital investment uh, in health care in really the two major redevelopment programs that we have here at the QE2 and the redevelopment that's happening on Cape Breton Island. Uh, that really is about modernizing a health care delivery model. It's about modernizing the system the healthcare providers want to come in and work in. Uh, it was very clear to us uh, early on uh, that we needed to make sure that we had the physical infrastructure that would be attracting uh, these healthcare teams from around the world to come and want to work and live here. Uh, we believe that is part of it. If you look out in rural communities, we're building a collaborative care model where we have all of our healthcare teams working together, nurse practitioners, family practice, nurses, dietitians. It's my belief in some of our communities that social workers will become an important part of that team of ensuring that not only are we dealing with the issue that's facing the family today and the illness that the family's facing, but what are the determinants around the cause of that illness and how can we improve those? Uh, and I will tell you, uh, the issue of physician uh, attraction uh, is, is a global issue. Uh, when you look at what's happening inside of, of uh, Canada, we have the fourth highest attachment of patients to primary care in the country. Now, there's more work to do, of course. Uh, and that is part of that is building that infrastructure. The investment that we've made at the medical seat, to increasing more medical seats, uh, 16 new will start this coming year. We we're four last year. They're towards Indigenous and African Nova Scotian and rural students uh, to attract uh, them and give them an opportunity to get a medical degree here at home. Uh, and we're looking forward to continuing to work with our partners to ensure uh, that we deliver, that we accept primary care. But I think it was in Emma's remarks when she talked about change and the uncertainty of change. 
This is the one place where Nova Scotians and I would argue Canadians need to, need to embrace the issue of innovation and change. We have to stop wanting to keep the system of our grandparents. And in essence, that's what people are, quote, that's what people are looking for, the status quo. Where else in our lives do we accept the status quo? How, wanna, how many in this room would want to turn back your professional life to that of your parents? I mean, it would want to turn back to the mobility that you have in relationship to your grandparents. Of course you wouldn't. So why do we think that healthcare delivery models should look like the same as it did for your grandparents? It shouldn't. Thank you. I, I agree. Uh, a we quick should stop right now, Patrick. We've agreed too much. Today. We have. We have agreed too much. Sorry. One last question, a quick answer. Uh, what is the Nova Scotia government doing to reduce interprovincial trade barriers so our people can do better? Uh, uh, I think Fred Crooks must have wrote that. <laughs> uh, listen, the inter, inter, uh, interprovincial trade uh, to me uh, is one of the areas where we as a province have really led the nation. Uh, whether it is working with our sister provinces in Atlantic Canada or quite frankly across the nation. Fred and his team Minister McClellan, who I saw earlier, uh, our trade minister, have been working uh, extremely hard to ensure that we take down uh, the barriers uh, that exist within our province. Uh, Fred has the mandate uh, to get us uh, to eliminate as many regulations as possible. That's not to eliminate all regulations because some of them are important. But quite frankly, the regulations that are uh, there to, to isolate our economy or to protect our economy for a certain few are wrong. We need to open up the barriers around our province and, and borders and realize that we can compete. And one of the things that I was just referring to at, a, at our table was Atlantic Canada can lead the way, and Fred and his team have been doing great work, of taking down those barriers. And when it happens in Atlantic Canada, it spreads across the nation. We started the issue around apprenticeship uh, work and te tearing down the barriers around the apprenticeship programs. It went across the nation. We've continued to eliminate trucking barriers when it comes to whether it's medical kits, whether it's wide tires uh, that are produced by Michelin, quite frankly, by, by the way, here. Uh, we eliminate the barriers and it went across the nation. Those are just two examples. Occupational health and safety. We worked on Atlantic Canada and it's gone across the nation. Uh, that's been the work that has taken place. Uh, there is more work to do. Uh, I believe there are more work by our partners. I think the College of Physicians, College of Nursing, our professional organizations need to recognize that the people who belong to those organizations are Canadian citizens. They have the right to work in Canada, not just in a particular province. If you're a medical, if you're a medical doctor in New Brunswick, I think you should be able to practice in Nova Scotia if you so choose, instead of going through the bear and the red tape. The colleges are there to ensure that they protect us. <laughs> The colleges are there to ensure that the people who are practicing in our respective provinces are, are doing so in the appropriate way, but they shouldn't be there as a barrier. And uh, what might have been acceptable in 1960 doesn't reflect 2020. And that's what we need is that kind of, uh, of uh, level of, of collaboration amongst our sister organizations uh, to keep up with the Canadian population, quite honestly. And, and, and I just ask, this of all of us. This isn't about being, let's, let's stop trying to be protectionist. It only isolates us. Let's be confident about how we compete in a global economy. We, it, is, it is possible. This country was founded on trade for over 400 years ago. Over 400 years ago, the foundation of this country was trade. We need to move away from these regulations that protect us and isolate us from a global economy, we need to open it up. Thank you. I hesitate to say I agree again, but uh, 
I, I have to agree with that one. Someone asked if we were going to dance earlier. We might start dancing. We might start fact, dancing. Right. Thank you very much. Well, we're almost out of time. We're almost out of time. We're out of time. So thank you very much, Premier, uh, for taking the time to speak to our members today. And thank you uh, to our members for asking questions. We very much appreciate it. I hope you all learned something today. Um, certainly there was news, so thank you very much. Uh, we're pleased to see progress on a number of fronts and very much look forward to continuing our positive relationship with the provincial government. We have made a donation to Feed Nova Scotia in your name. Uh, we had Nick uh, Jennery at our table today. And I'd like to thank again today's sponsor, National Public Relations, for giving us the opportunity to host this annual event. Thank you very much, and thank you particularly, Emma. Before we head out, we have an exciting prize draw generously donated by WestJet. You look like you want to say something. You don't want to say something. Okay. Or you do. I, I do want to recognize in this room, I mentioned a number of my colleagues uh, who, are, who are here, but there's many more that are here. Uh, I, I can't mention them all by name, uh, and people who work uh, with us. Uh, in government. Uh, uh, first of all, to my own uh, caucus, uh, I, I'm indebted to the loyalty that you've demonstrated to me over the last six years uh, to allow us to get to the point where we're where we are. And, and I know I've asked you to do a lot of things that have been uncomfortable at times, and I appreciate your loyalty and commitment. To the people who work on my behalf and with me uh, in government, uh, on behalf of our political staff, uh, both current and former, I see some former, uh, they escaped. Uh, I want to say thank you uh, for your uh, wa unwavering commitment not only to me but to our caucus. Uh, and then furthermore, I know I ran into a number of people from the bureaucracy here, people, who, civil servants. Uh, you know, I've said this to them and I'll say it to this room, when people refer to the damn government, uh, they're talking about the elected body, they're not talking about the men and women who serve us uh, every day. And I want to tell you, I know sometimes you may be frustrated by uh, what happens inside of government, uh, but how lucky are we uh, that people have chosen to spend their career uh, trying to make this province better, uh, and it's really remarkable. And on that, on that happy note, uh, let's do the draw for two tickets anywhere WestJet flies. Let's hope it's not an MLA that wins. Well, if they win, who's going with them? That's true. That's true. A constituent. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Someone was really smart. And while, while you're drawing that, I should say, Robert Palmer, the manager of public affairs, uh, was stuck in Montreal, unfortunately. Uh, not a Halifax airport issue. Uh, I'm sure it was a Montreal airport issue. Uh, so WestJet does strongly support the Premier's efforts to build the Atlantic Gateway along with the marine, rail and roadways. Air service is a critical part of the transportation infrastructure. And WestJet is committed to working with the Nova Scotia government. Boy, oh boy, they, uh, he had some good things to say. Too bad he couldn't make it. Uh, and, the, <laughs> and the winner is, the winner is, I think it's, um, it's Whitney Mac something. It kind of goes down to a little thing. Um, Whitney Mac something from the MS Society uh, Atlantic Division. Whitney. So Whitney, just come on over to the side, and Emma will, uh, will take care of you. Uh, and my last page, uh, congratulations again to the winner. Thank you very much, Premier, for joining us today. And thank you to, uh, to National. We hope to see you on Friday at another luncheon, the power of partnerships on how business and not-for-profits can connect for greater impact. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Premier McNeil.